Well, again, good morning and welcome to High View Baptist Church. I'm Isaac Frazier, one of the ministers of music here. And it's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. If you're a guest, would you please look at the bottom of the bulletin that you got on the way in. Fill out that connect card there so that we can get to know you, minister to your family in the days ahead as well. Put that in the offering plate a little later on the service, if you would. You know, as we come to worship this morning, there's a deep reality that every human being has to face, and that is that we are sinful. But praise be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His blood. Would you guys look at this verse from Romans, Romans chapter 5. It says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us. And that while we were still sinners, what did he do? Christ died for us. It goes on to say, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We're saved from the wrath of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate the work that he did on the cross for us this morning lift up his name. He is worthy. Amen. Sing with me. a crown of
day to worship together I want to do something I do every year as we get towards the holiday season I cheerfully remind God's people especially those parents with children in the home I cheerfully remind God's people that the Bible says that the borrower is a slave to the lender and I say in the happiest form I can, don't let Christmas make you a fool. <laughs> I have to warn in advance because this is the time of year when people make decisions that they're going to keep up with the Joneses and they're going to get just every little thing they could imagine they want to get, even if it's beyond their budgets. So let me just encourage you, uh, if you will help your children know that Jesus is the reason for the season. If you will live within your means, you will be amazed how God will bless your holiday season and allow you to have a happy January. Because <laughs> whatever you do in October, November, and December, 30 days later is coming. Uh, and then also, we certainly want to be able to be faithful stewards. <clears throat> over the things that God uh, has put under our hands. And so as regards the Great Commission and the sending emphasis that we have here at Highview, as regards uh, our local church ministry and Love Louisville and opportunities to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God in our community, we want to be able to be faithful stewards. And so uh, every week uh, you see in our worship guide uh, where we are on our budget and just encourage you to be faithful in your stewardship. And uh, I've been there. I really just do want to encourage you, parents, just to remember, don't let Christmas put you in an uncomfortable position so that there's no joy in January. Uh, I want us to pray and I'm going to ask our ushers to come and receive our offering and then I have a special announcement I'm going to share with you while we are giving. So let me invite our ushers to come and uh, receive our time of, uh, of offering. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful for the many, many things that you put under our hands. As you do those things, Lord, may we be faithful stewards of that which you give us, our time, our financial resources, and certainly our efforts and our devotion. Bless this time of giving that we might do the work of your kingdom here at Highview. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And while you're giving, let me just remind you that we're going to do something very special on November 17th. All of us, and when I say all of us, I don't mean all of us in this room. I mean the, in the Big Mama family reunion sense. All of us. High View at Fagenbush Campus, 9 o'clock and 10.30. High View at Valley Station. High View at our East Campus. We're all going to come together on November 17th for our one service. And we're going to worship together as we celebrate 60 years of ministry of High View Baptist Church. Our service will be at 10 a.m. at our East Campus. Uh, we will not have any ABF meetings at Valley Station or at Fagenbush. 
we will all gather together at 10 a.m. in one place and we will look around and we will look at high view together as we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and thank him for his goodness. Pastor Les and I want to challenge you and encourage you about some things we see in the future. And also, we want to have a time of celebration and thanksgiving. Uh, Pastor Kevin Ezell and Jimmy Scroggins will be with us. And we just want to have a wonderful time of celebrating on November 17th. So our one service on November 17th, I want to urge you to be there, invite you to be there, that we might worship together. Uh, we'll have some trans. Those of you who all who who just walk over across the street and that kind of thing, we're going to have some transportation uh, to get you over to the East Campus, and we're going to just have a wonderful time of worship together. Amen. So I want to encourage you to get excited about High View, all of us coming together and worshiping the Lord together. Now, as we prepare to sing and be led in worship, I want to remind you. That when we began our Big God series in the summer and we talked about the attributes of God, we began with the Lord our God is holy. And so as the choir sings, I want you to just listen and gather with them and let your hearts be lifted with them as we consider the attributes of our God. God is holy and then we're going to rejoice in his wonderful attributes together.
Amen. Amen. Mm. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. You know what, man? I, I pray a lot for God to bless me. Do you? I mean, I, I think that's, a, that's an okay prayer. He holds all blessing. I want some of that blessing. But hey, what, what, if we, what, if we, what if we lived to be a blessing to him a little more, huh? A lot more. What if we really desire for, for our lives to bless him as much as we desire for, for him to bless us? Let's, can we just praise the name of God this morning? Can we praise the name of Jesus this morning? And we, can we just bless him? Because he's blessed us so much. Let's just pray together. Father, we bless your name today. And Lord, if you, if you never did one more thing for us, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. You've been so good to us. You've blessed us so much. You, you just bless us with life, with the world around us, with the freedom that we have in our nation, the freedom that we have even more in Christ. And we bless you for that, Father. We, we bless you for being holy and omnipotent and omnipresent and all, all of those attributes, Lord, that we can only shake our head at and try to understand. We bless you for all of those things. And Father, we bless you today for your word and we pray that you would speak to our hearts through the word today. Father, we, I bless you that you can use a flawed vessel like this pastor. I pray, Lord, and I thank you and I bless you that your Holy Spirit can speak through any of us, Lord, if we're willing to be obedient. And so, Father, help us to be obedient today and be true to your word and then apply it as we leave and be doers of the word and not hearers only. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I don't know if you know who James Janos, I think it's Janos or Janos, really not sure, um, but if you don't recognize that name, maybe you'll know what he goes by, it's Jesse Ventura. And, and Jesse Ventura is a former governor of Minnesota, kind of a tough guy. He's a Navy SEAL, professional wrestler, uh, action movie uh, actor, and just, a, just an independent, no-nonsense, get-it-done kind of guy. And when he was governor of Minnesota, here's what he said. Organized religion is a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. It tells people to go out and stick their noses in other people's business. I live by the golden rule, he said. Treat others as you want them to treat you. So that's kind of confusing, right? Because on the one hand, he's quoting the Lord Jesus, at least one of the things that he said. But on the other hand, he's, he's ridiculing the church of Jesus Christ, the, what he founded, what he established. And then he, so he ridicules the church of Jesus, along with other organized religious type stuff. Now, we may just write Jesse Ventura off, but his opinion is held by a lot of people. There are a lot of people that just don't believe that they need God, they don't believe that they need the Lord, they don't believe that they need the body of Christ or a fellowship of believers by faith, they don't believe any of that stuff. But there's others who've seen their need and then who've responded to the Lord. Danny Velasco was a, a heroin addict. He lived in New York, and a friend of his especially tried to get Danny to repent of his sin and to turn to Jesus for help. And, and she would say, Danny, um, Jesus is your only hope because you're living a life of self-destruction. But he rejected the Lord, and Danny Velasco eventually lived on the streets of New York and because of uh, drug addiction and just the, 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 the life and a lot of the filth and the ill health of the streets, he began to get very paranoid and have all kinds of phobias and fears along with his drug addiction. And then he got uh, hepatitis A and hepatitis B and hepatitis C and he started to hear voices. And these voices in his head would, would shout at him, would accuse him, and, and they, would, they would curse and, and spew out profanities, at least in his head. He would hear these voices so that he was finally put into the hospital, and, and he wanted to go into the hospital because he didn't want to die on the streets of New York, and he knew he was dying. 
And as he was in that hospital room, he said, even in that place, those voices in his head kept screaming at him and, and kept hurling accusations at him. And then in the midst of all those voices, he heard a different voice, he said. And he said he didn't know if it was just from the memories of his friend telling him about Jesus or if it was just a still small voice of the Holy Spirit. But there in that hospital room, Danny Velasco said that he heard this still small voice right inside of his own head amidst all those other voices. But this voice said, the day that you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be set free. And so Danny says that in the midst of that place, just him by himself, he cried out to God in desperation. And he said, oh Jesus, I, I believe in you. Would you help me? God, would you please save me? And Danny Velasco says that in the midst of that hospital room, he sensed the Spirit of God, just felt the Spirit of God come through that place. And he said immediately the voices that were in his head stopped. And, and immediately, he says, the, he was overwhelmed with a sense of, in the presence of the Holy Spirit in that place. And he said, all those fears and all those phobias immediately left. And Danny Velasco says he was saved that day. And he knew at that moment that he would never be the same. And he died several years later after, the God, after God temporarily restored him so that he could tell that story to thousands of people all over the world. Now you hear a story like Danny Velasco's and especially people who are followers of Jesus, you can't help but be encouraged by that and inspired by that. And, and even people who might not be followers of Christ would say things like, like, you know, way to go, good for you. You found something that would give you hope in the midst of all that destruction. But doesn't the story of Danny Velasco sort of, sort of support Jesse Ventura's opinion? For people who need that emotional and spiritual crutch, for people who are just weak of body or weak of mind, well that, that belief is not new. There were people who believed that in Jesus' day as well, and he spoke to that. And in this series that we've been in called Black and White, we've been dealing with some of the harder sayings of Jesus and the ones that may be counterintuitive or counterculture, as many of the teachings of Jesus were. But look at this one. Let's read together from Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. It says, after that, he went out and noticed a tax collector, Jesus that is, named Levi, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he, Levi, left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples and saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And he answered, and Jesus answered and said to them, It's not those who are well who need a physician but those who are sick. And then the hard saying, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke starts off in the story saying, after that, he went out. Well, after what? Well, Jesus had been in the region of the, the Sea of Galilee, also called the Lake of Gennesaret, or the Lake of Tiberias. And in that region, he had called some of his disciples. And as many people would gather and listen to Jesus, people understood that he had these powers that God had given him. And so and just before this, a group of men brought a friend of theirs who couldn't walk into the presence of Jesus. They couldn't even get in the house where Jesus was, so they dug a, uh, they dug a place out of the roof and they lowered the man down so that they could get in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus healed the man. And he also told this individual, your sins are forgiven. Now, there were a couple of things that really bothered these religious leaders, the Pharisees. First of all, they had a problem with Jesus healing on the Sabbath because they considered that work and you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. And they certainly had a problem with Jesus speaking for God and telling somebody that their sins were forgiven. And they started to call Jesus a blasphemer. And so it's just after that, now that these, these critics are starting to 
become an, an issue for Jesus and starting to be more vocal. And it says after that, he went out and he noticed a tax collector named Levi. By the way, Levi is also Matthew, the disciple, same, same individual. In fact, Matthew tells the story himself in his gospel and uh, he uses the name Matthew. So Levi was another name, sitting at the tax booth. Now this was, uh, uh, tax collectors were, um, you know, it, it's hard to have an equivalent in our culture for a tax collector. It's not like a tax assessor. It's not even really like somebody who works for the IRS. If you can just, if you can just imagine this with, with some of the, these, uh, these scandals that have been on the news about what, what, have, what has the IRS been doing and a targeting, potentially targeting conservative groups and all of that. So there's some trust issues involved. Multiply that many, 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 many times over and that's how the Jewish people felt about a tax collector. Because they, first of all, were employed by the Roman government. They were sort of franchised out by the Roman government. They were, they were Jewish themselves because they were sort of a go-between between the Jewish people and the Roman government. And they would tax these individuals. But they could charge extra taxes. Rome would say, Caesar would say, we, need, we want this much from you. And if they charged more, they just charged more. The people had to pay it. So they were extortionists in addition to being traitors. We don't know what, this, what kind of tax booth this was or tax collector he was. Some people think it was a, like a toll booth going in and out of town. Some people believe it might have been since it was by the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, that maybe it was like a ferry tax that people would get in to boat across the lake or something. We're really not sure, but he was despised by the Jewish people. You can guarantee that. And you know what? Even Jesus himself, who, who loved people and who goes to Levi, even Jesus... The tax collectors were dubious to, to the Lord even. He, he, he said in Matthew 5, 46, Jesus said, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? So Jesus is saying, even, even those people, even, even those in their culture, even those low lowlifes act like that. So what, what, what's that saying uh, about yourself? You know, here's the thing. One of the things that we know about the Lord is that he, he comes to us, he loves us, he cares for us, he has compassion on us, but he doesn't lie to us. But he, he, he went to Levi as, as Levi is practicing his sin. As he is ripping people off. He doesn't wait until Levi gets his act together. He didn't, he didn't even wait on Matthew to come to him and say, Lord, I've been listening to you and I've been watching you. Could I be one of your disciples? No, he goes to him. He, he's proactive and goes to him. Now, in the Gospels, not everybody went to Jesus. Uh, not, not, Jesus didn't go to everybody. Sometimes they came to him. The rich young ruler went to Jesus. Nicodemus went to Jesus by night. Zacchaeus went and climbed a tree in order to go and look for Jesus and look at Jesus and learn more about Jesus. But in this case... Jesus comes to him, and I hope that everybody here knows what it's like for Jesus to come to you. And if you don't, why don't you prayerfully listen to the rest of this story so that he will, and so that you'll hear him as he does. Matthew eleven nineteen 19 says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So although he was honest about who tax collectors were, it didn't stop him from, from going to them anyway. And he does the same for you and me. The, earlier in the service, Isaac Frazier read some of this verse, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even while we were sinners, even while we were in our sin, the Lord Jesus died for us. Now, Here's what this message and what this passage of scripture is really all about. It's about self-righteousness. This, this story is really about a sense of being superior to other people and thinking that they need the Lord or they're more desperate than we are. So anytime I start to feel superior to somebody else, this is a good reminder to me, and this, this should really keep me in check, that I didn't look for God first, he came to me. 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Look at verse 28. And when Jesus said, follow me, he, meaning Levi, left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. That, in a nutshell, is what it means to follow Jesus. To leave everything behind. You say, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ, pastor? What does it mean to really follow Jesus? This is it. We leave everything behind. And if there's anything that stands before us and Christ, it's a God to us. And you can't serve two masters. By the way, I know that there are a lot of people in this place that have already come to Christ. He knocked on the door of your heart and you said, yes, Lord, please save me. And he did. But there can still be things that we grasp onto. And if we're grasping onto them, if they keep us from the relationship with Christ that he wants to have, it's still an idol, it's still a God. Amen? I mean, can, can anybody agree with me that we choose to follow other things or other people and we disobey the Lord Jesus? Sure we do. Of course we do. And it's impossible to cling to one thing while we're clinging to something else. It, physically, it's impossible. And spiritually, it's impossible. You can't, you cannot, I cannot clutch onto this podium and, be, and clutch onto something else. I've got to release this first and then cling to this. And by the way, God did that. Paul says in Philippians that Jesus did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he released it, he let go of it, and he became a person, a human being, a baby born in a manger, lived a perfect di uh, life, died a savior's atoning suffering death and was raised anew for you and for me but he released something before he clinged to something else and i tell you man i have the utmost respect for all of these disciples but there's something different about levi because you know something when the other, the other disciples, many of them were fishermen, they were blue collar, they were tradesmen. Many of them could go back to what they were doing before they became a follower of Jesus. Not Levi. Peter, James, John. If things went south, they could go back to fishing. Levi walked away from the tax booth. The Romans would have never accepted anybody back that abandoned their post. He was all in. He was done with his former life. Are you? Or maybe you've bowed your head and said what some people refer to as the sinner's prayer, but Jesus said, I want you to follow me and leave that and leave that and leave that and leave that. And you know in your heart you haven't left anything. You just wanted some insurance. If something stands between you and Christ... If something causes you, it may be, you may, not, you, you may say, you know, I don't, I don't need all of that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be all in and, and I'm kind of afraid. I've got lots and lots of friends. They would ridicule me. They would harass me. They would give me a hard time. Or you say, I've got this habit or this lifestyle. God doesn't want that. Whenever I can quit that, whenever I have enough discipline to turn my back on that, then I'll trust Jesus. That's not how God wants you. God wants you to trust him first. And because of your allegiance to him, now you forsake everything else. And if anything stands between you and doing that, it will send you to hell. Jesus said in Matthew 5, just, um, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for the whole body to go into hell. So if you, whatever is causing you to hold back, release it because nothing is worth that. Verse 29 says, Levi gave this big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd uh, of tax collectors 
and other people who were reclining at the table with them. Now when they had a, a meal or a gathering like this, it, it was the normal posture for them to recline like this and the table be uh, down toward the ground. But don't you love the enthusiasm of Levi? I mean, here's a man that just begins his journey with Christ and now it, there, there is some low-hanging fruit in his life. Okay, these other friends, these other tax collectors, I mean, he just looks around them and he sees this as a mission field. And he invites them to come to Jesus too. Why do we lose the joy and the enthusiasm of knowing Jesus so quickly? You know, one of the things that makes it hard to live missionally is that the longer we're a believer, I mean, the, a lot of the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, they just aren't, they're not appealing anymore. Oh, we're tempted by the flesh and all of that. But a lot of that stuff's just like, you know what? I left that behind. I, I, know, I know a worship leader that was saved out of the uh, southern rock alcohol bar scene. And, and he's had opportunities to go back and be reunited with some of the old band members and things like that. And he could use some of that for the sake of the gospel. But he's, he, he's an alcoholic. He's recovering. He's been on the wagon for several years. And he's just like... Unless there's just some things that I can't do. And there was, that almost killed him. And he didn't want any part of that anymore. And, and you know, I get all of that. But, but there's another side as well. As much as you can. When you're saved, especially if you're saved as a teenager or adult, when we talk about, you'll hear us refer to the phrase living on mission. We're not talking about a professional missionary that goes someplace in Africa. I mean, some might do that, or people here that have done that. People here that will do that. But we're talking about living on mission where you are. That means that God's put you in a mission field. And the, the natural, the tempting thing is, when we come to Christ, is burn all those bridges and leave all of that behind. But be very careful, because somebody lived on mission for you. And God wants you to live on mission for others. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul wrote, I wrote, in, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean at all with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. But, he, but actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So he says, don't be with those that are playing games. What we would call, you know, a carnal Christian, if there is such a thing. Somebody who's living in a backslidden state. You'd be very, very cautious how you provide fellowship for a person in that state because they need to be convicted of their sin. They're not in good fellowship, so... So at any rate, he tells who's there, verse 30, the scribes and the Pharisees began grumbling at his disciples. Notice they weren't grumbling at Jesus yet. They're talking to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and, and sinners? But Jesus gets very personal with them. Now, hang on a second, because um, he, here's, they got two problems, really. It's the same problem that you and I can have sometimes. They had too low an opinion of Jesus and too high an opinion of themselves. And, and what you'll discover is the more you get an accurate picture of God, the more you get an accurate picture of the majesty and the, and the holiness of Jesus, now we're, we're going to get a better understanding of really the reality of who we are. We're not looking in the mirror, seeing us ourselves with our own eyes. We're standing beside Jesus and comparing ourselves to him. And now see what happens. Here's what happened to a few people. Job in the Old Testament when God spoke, God listened to Job's foolishness, and then God began to speak wisdom into Job. And when Job understood the unbelievable, awesome wisdom of God, he put his hand over his mouth. He even said, I put my hand over my mouth. When, uh, when Isaiah, Isaiah goes into the temple and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he sees the holiness of God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what happens when you see God for who he is. They just didn't see Jesus for really who he was. They saw a man. 
when Simon Peter, just a few verses before this, when Simon Peter is called to be a follower of Jesus, Jesus introduces himself to Simon by saying, throw your nets on this side of the boat, you'll catch some fish. And Simon says, Master, we've been doing this all night long. We've been doing this all night long. He said, we'll do it anyway. And they haul in so much fish, they, he's got to have help get him out of the water. And he falls down before Jesus and he says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Just with that. When Thomas saw Jesus, he fell down and he said, my Lord, my God. And when Paul, throughout his life, began to get a better glimpse of the holiness of, and the perfection of Jesus, he just said, you know what, I am the worst sinner in the world. That's the apostle Paul. Not in the beginning of his life or his ministry, but toward the end. Well, Jesus told a story about a Pharisee and a publican. He might have had Levi in mind, I don't know. But they both go into the temple and the Pharisee prays this unbelievable prayer. He's thanking God that he's not like all these people who are sinful. And then he says, especially not this tax collector. And the publican, the tax collector, won't even go to the front of the temple. He stands way back, he beats his chest, and he pleads to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, only one of those left and went home justified, and it was the tax collectors. One of the ways that you know if you're guilty of self-righteousness, please listen to me. One of the ways you know if you're guilty of self-righteousness is if you're always seeing the flaws in other people, but you can never see your own. That's a clue. Because God doesn't grade on the curve. He didn't compare me to you, and he didn't compare you to me. He compares us all with Jesus. And when he compares us all with Jesus, our greatest righteousness are like filthy rags. He said in Isaiah 64, 6, for all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So Jesus answers them. Now they didn't speak to it. They're talking to his disciples, but this is what Jesus does once with his disciples. He said, who do people say that I am? They gave him various answers. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? And so Jesus gets personal with them. He answers them and he says, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now you know something? They didn't fool Jesus. He could look right through them. He knew they weren't well. He knew they weren't whole. But what he's really telling them there is because you think you are, because you think you are, you'll never know God. Because you think you really get all of this. And then Matthew, uh, in his account, not Luke, but Matthew in his account, he includes one more detail. This is what Matthew says in Matthew 9, 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. That's a quote from Hosea 6, 6. And it's God saying, you know what? I don't want all your religious rituals. I don't need your money. I don't need your sacrifices. What I want is your love. What I want is your, and, and in Hosea 6, 6, he says, I, I want your allegiance and not sacrifice. And in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings, that's what I delight in. So when I, I want to ask you, are you desperate or are you self-sufficient? Say, boy, it's been a long time since I've sensed the Spirit of God moving in my life. How badly do you want to see the Spirit of God moving in your life? Do you pray? Do you listen to God? Do you meditate on His Word? I don't have time, Les. I just don't have time for all that. Really? I know people who thought that. I've thought that before. And then God reminded me that I did have time. And I better take time. I don't want bad things to happen. I don't want bad things to happen to me or you. But I can guarantee you this. If your daughter, your, if your unmarried teenage daughter tells you that she's pregnant, you'll find time to pray. If you're on the verge of having your house foreclosed on, you'll be desperate for God. I mean, we could just go through a list. So I'd say, are you desperate for him? In another occasion with the Pharisees and the scribes were being critical of Jesus, he had just healed a man that was born blind. It's in John chapter 9. 
And then they ridiculed Jesus, but he's, they, they, I mean, they, they questioned and interrogated the man and all that. But Jesus finally said, you know something? I came to give sight to the blind. I came for the blind. And then Jesus told these same people, he said, the ones who think they can see, they're actually the blind ones. And then the Pharisees said, are you calling us blind? So now we're blind. And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. And so I would just ask you, how's your sight? Are you just seeing fine these days? Or do you realize your need for the Lord? In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is dictating to John, who's, who writes the book, a letter to give to the church in Laodicea. The church in Laodicea, Laodicea was a wealthy city in Asia Minor. Um, they were known for their banking industry and for wool and fine linen. They were also known for developing this eye salve to treat poor eyesight and, and, uh, and blindness. And they were wealthy. They were very independent. They were so independent that in 60 AD, they were rocked by an earthquake and they refused any outside help from Rome because they could do it themselves. And here's what Jesus said for John to write and to tell them. He said, because, because you say, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me refined by, uh, gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you will see. Paul wrote in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. But there was one. And his name is Jesus. And he's the only one who's ever been righteous. And here's, listen, listen, here's the miracle of salvation. The miracle of salvation is that when I turn to Jesus and I trust in him to forgive me of that sin, and to, what happens in that miraculous transaction is that when I place my faith and trust in him and his work for me on the cross, then God takes his righteousness and he puts it on me. And he throws out my filthy rags. And he clothes me with the righteousness of Christ. And here's the beautiful thing. This is the miracle of it all. God just doesn't look at me in my sin and then say, no, 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 you're righteous. That would be an unjust. If, if a judge looks at somebody guilty and says, oh, no, that's okay. Go ahead, you're fine. That's an unjust judge. That's a crooked judge. What God does is different. God doesn't just declare me righteous. He makes me righteous. You see the difference? Because of that faith, because of that trust and the grace that's offered through Jesus, he just changes you. And he takes that unrighteousness away and he places on you the righteousness of his son. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they'll be like wool. Charles Wesley wrote a, the words of a hymn. It's, the hymn is, and can it be, and can it be that I should gain? It just says, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. So what do we do with all of this? Let me just mention a couple things. First of all, we are to go to people with the gospel live missionally man the way that Matthew did to these that were around him and never lose that sense of desperation and also you know something when people come to church we shouldn't be a respecter of persons and treat one person one way and one person the next and because somebody's wealthy we're after them and we're recruiting them and we're trying to get them in and they're a hot prospect but this person over here that comes in dressed in rags we don't give the time of day that's just wrong because we may not believe, we may not feel like we're desperate, but without Christ, all of us are. And then remember Jesus' words, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. Now real quickly, a couple of things you just need to know. 
You may say, well, I'll make poor decisions now, but you know, Jesus will forgive me, and if all that's true, I'll accept his righteousness later. No, it didn't work like that. And in addition to that, here's what happens. You and I live with the consequences of our sin. And God can forgive you through Jesus, but one poor choice you make today can change your life and the people around you for the rest of your life. I love the verse in Jude that says, to the one who's able to keep us from falling. Stuart Hamblin was a popular singer in his day. He was kind of one of the first singing cowboys, radio personality, songwriter back in the 30s through the 50s, 1930s through 50s. Um, he was in movies with people like Gene Autry and John Wayne and others. Pretty popular guy, but he was also known for his heavy drinking and hard living. Billy Graham was just really beginning to gain momentum in his ministry. He hadn't really turned that tipping point where he was super popular yet, but um, he went to Los Angeles in 1949, and Stuart Hamlin asked him to be on his uh, radio show, one of the most popular shows in the region at the time. And so Graham appeared, Billy Graham appeared on the show and talked about the crusade, and Hamlin was really warm toward him because his dad had been a Methodist minister. And Billy Graham invited him to the crusade. And so he accepted the invitation. He went and he heard the gospel and then he asked Billy Graham if he could come later on to his hotel and talk to him. And so Billy Graham said, sure. And Billy Graham's associate, Cliff Barrels, said that that trip to the, hot, to the hotel room of Billy Graham ended up with, with uh, Stuart Hamblin being saved. And God touched his heart, radically saved him, and he changed immediately. He Turned his back on the drink and he, he just, he, he totally, he just completely changed. In fact, he became an advocate for the temperance from alcohol movement and he eventually ran for president. But Burroughs, Cliff Burroughs says that, that later he was on a street in Hollywood and he ran into John Wayne, his buddy. And John said, hey Stuart, is it true the rumors that I hear about you that are going around that you've changed your ways? And Hamlin said, yeah, it's no secret what God's done. And then he said to John Wayne, he, he can do it for you too. And John Wayne said, Stuart, you ought to write a song about that. And so he did. And for years and years, it was almost like one of the theme songs of the Billy Graham crusade. And it says, the chimes of time ring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened. For I have news for you. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. You know, you may not be as desperate as Danny Velasco. You may not be as desperate as Stuart Hamblin or Levi the tax collector. You may not feel like you are, but we all are. We just don't know it. Could I get you to bow your heads and close your eyes, please? We're going to have an invitation, just, just a very brief few moments, because we're going to come back in just a second. If you'll, if you'll keep your seats, we're going to all have the Lord's Supper as a fellowship in just a couple of minutes but you know, I just want to ask you are, do you think that you see with 2020 spiritual vision you know probably not have you ever admitted your desperate situation before the Lord let me ask you this for those of you that are Christians when's the last time you really cried out to God because you were desperate you may say, but you don't understand, Pastor, man, I'm, I'm doing good. My situation's good. Everything seems to be fine right now. Well, I mean, do you need to wait until your earthly circumstances remind you of our need for God before you cry out to Him? How about experiencing a fresh touch from the Lord starting today? How about calling out to Him right now? Or maybe you're satisfied with where you are.
I hope you're never, never satisfied. Father, while we wait in this place, Lord, in a, in a spirit, in an attitude of prayer, we're reminded, Lord, of that old song, just as I am without one plea, but that's the, that thy blood was shed for me. Lord, we, we come to you. So thank you for receiving us as we are, but taking us to where you want us to be. In your name we pray. You know, I'm just going to ask you to stay where you are with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Why don't you just spend some time with the Lord and ask Him to search your own heart and call out to Him with the, with the desperateness of heart, even if you think right now, I'm well, I'm whole. And if you have never called upon the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. He died on the cross for you. So I'm going to ask you to stand where you are and walk down to the front. Talk to one of our ministers. Talk to one of our pastors about what it means to be saved. So let's just dwell here with these moments. Just as I am. Isaac, why don't you just lead us in that? Just as I am without one plea.